Hello everybody, uh, Bruce Robison here from All Saints Church in Brighton Heights, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and with my weekly Vickers video. So we're looking forward now to uh, Sunday, March 16th, 2021, uh, the seventh Sunday of the Easter season, and uh, marked on our church calendars as well as the Sunday after the Ascension. Uh, we're in this 10-day mini-season beginning this past Thursday, the Feast of the Ascension, uh, and now approaching the end of Easter and preparing for the grand finale uh, next week on Sunday, May 23rd, when we will celebrate Whitsunday, the day of Pentecost. Uh, on that day, of course, we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit over the life and ministry of the church, this, this great gift, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, our advocate and guide the continuing teacher that Jesus promised us, uh, our comforter and our sustainer, um, the Holy Spirit sharing the fullness of the Father and the Son, inspiring us and equipping us uh, as in us and through us, Christ continues to be very active every day, building his strong and beautiful church. Uh, you know, when I, I think about the life of the church at this time of year, and I think almost of my now almost 40 years of ordained ministry, um, that a lot of the time I spend uh, energy and focus with worry about the church. Uh, sometimes I'm worried about a particular congregation or even about a particular ministry or characteristic or program or activity, something, even an individual, with, but within the life of a congregation. And sometimes I'm worrying about the character of the wider church, uh, our denomination, our Episcopal church, uh, global Anglicanism with all of its uh, moving parts, we might say, uh, all the different denominations and traditions of Christian life that surround us, the whole body of faithful people, uh, the mystical communion, the body of Christ. Uh, and I guess it's okay to be worrying. Uh, sort of what I signed up for when I was ordained as a presbyter, a priest, uh, an elder, uh, uh, ordained to the ministries of leadership and good stewardship, uh, care for the church. Uh, one of the many sheepdogs that our Lord Jesus, the good shepherd, brings out along with him uh, as he cares for his flock. So I worry, I guess, as any good border collie will worry. Uh, you know how the, the hymn goes, though with a scornful wonder men see her sore oppressed by schisms rent asunder by heresies distressed. And uh, we have seen so much of that even in our, our own age. Uh, it's not a new thing though. Uh, recently, so many uh, conversations about the life of the church, things to worry about, we might say, uh, have come about uh, really as a part of our experience of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, great disruptions and what have been our, our patterns and practices and routines of life and ministry in the church. Uh, and then questions now as we come toward the end of this long pandemic year, more than a year, uh, about whether what, what's going to happen next, whether we're going to go back now uh, such a thing were even possible to go back to the way things were before, uh, or, or whether there will be some kind of new normal that will emerge for what the church is like, and we're beginning perhaps to see some of that now, I, I don't know. Uh, some uh, have worried, and I worry about where, whether many of the things that have happened during this time of pandemic will, will uh, uh, leave us weaker in the church, uh, less able to do the, the ministry that we're called to do. Uh, I look around here in the east end of Pittsburgh where I live and I see many restaurants, many smaller businesses that have closed for good during this period. Uh, I, I see people who have lost jobs, uh, people who have had to, to move from their homes. Uh, I've had friends and colleagues who have had to uh, change plans, long-held plans that they had about their retirement. Um, I've seen others who have had to adjust some things about their thoughts of, of whether their kids were going to go to college or how they would go to college. Uh, I've seen some rising tides of unhealthy behavior, uh, interpersonal behavior, and uh, rising tides of things like alcohol, drug use, and happening all around, all around us. 
Um, you know that some congregations, I think, some churches may never really recover from this last year. That's a reality. Although it is early, we're still very early in this, and uh, it's hard to know. Uh, sometimes uh, 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 border collies just have to worry, uh, and uh, maybe that's something we all will do a little bit uh, during this season. Uh, but it is also true that new things happen. Um, things may be falling apart in some parts of our world, uh, but new things are happening. Uh, even in some of those closed businesses and closed restaurants, I've seen some new things develop, new businesses opening, new restaurants opening where old restaurants had been before. And who knows what that might mean for the church. Uh, uh, this morning uh, in a Zoom meeting with some friends, a colleague of mine was talking about how in his smaller congregation, uh, as they've begun this year after the the, the, the hiatus that we had over the Christmas time as they'd begun in-person services again. Um, only a handful of those who were regularly attending before have returned uh, to regular worship. But, but uh, he commented at the same time how the video of these of their Sunday services as they're live streamed on Facebook and YouTube and so on, uh, have uh, gathered week by week over a hundred and sometimes several hundred viewers online and not just folks in in the community of the congregation but from all around the country um, so we kind of scratch our heads and we we wonder what that all means I, I'm not really sure uh, maybe it means a lot maybe it's a great sign about the future or maybe it doesn't mean much of anything at all um, I don't know whether in five years things are going to, to look more or less the same around our churches or whether they'll be very different. It's hard to say. Uh, the word certainly is to keep praying about all of this. And, and for some of us, we'll just probably have to keep worrying as well. But, but um, I want to set that worrying in context now and to say it's really hard at least to be overcome by worry uh, when we have Easter and when we have Ascension, and when we have Pentecost, all rolling out before us in these weeks. Uh, uh, the thing that frightens the border collie uh, is that he thinks he's all by himself out there in the field, that he alone is in charge of getting all those sheep into the pen. But then, fortunately, he hears a whistle, a familiar whistle, a familiar voice, and he remembers the Good Shepherd. Uh, he's reminded, he's reassured, he's comforted uh, that, that, that he's not alone out there in the field. And we would be uh, reminded, reassured, and comforted as well uh, that, that we aren't out alone in this field. Uh, Jesus has the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand, the whole church in his hand. He's got you and me, brother, you and me, sister, the whole world in his hand, which is very good news. Feast of the Ascension, Feast of Pentecost. Uh, the forces of evil, the power of death defeated on the cross, the glory of the resurrection, the wonder of Easter morning, and the grand procession of our Lord and Savior as he is lifted up, lifted up, seated on the throne of heaven. Uh, we might remember from that first chapter of Acts, verses 1 through 11, about the, what those men in white, those angelic figures, told the disciples on the mountain, uh, that Jesus hadn't left them, that instead he is here with them now even more powerfully than he ever was before, that he is now ruling over all things in heaven and earth, uh, and that even now he is preparing his triumphant victory parade. Uh, it's a parade in which we will all be marching as well, even more than marching, where, where a parade that is intended to show us off, that Jesus is going to show us off as his prize, his glory, uh, to welcome and introduce his beautiful bride, his beautiful church. Uh, uh, we hear the angels at the ascension, Go on back to Jerusalem and await further instructions. The Spirit will be there to make sure everything happens perfectly, to make sure that everything happens just the way it's supposed to happen from here on out. Now, 
our collect and our readings for this Sunday after the Ascension are all about this. They, they build on this for us. Go back to Jerusalem and await further instructions. The Spirit will be there for you to make sure everything happens perfectly, just the way it's supposed to happen. Uh, the Collect of the Day uh, was translated for this Sunday of the Church here, uh, translated from Latin to English by Archbishop Thomas Cranmer uh, as he prepared the first English Book of Common Prayer, 1549. And uh, we can hear in this prayer this, this looking forward to, to Pentecost in the midst of this uh, experience, in the midst of this exaltation of the, uh, of, of the Ascension. Uh, we can hear something about ourselves and about who we are, about all of us sheep and sheepdogs, all of us together under the care of our shepherd, uh, we who are now citizens of, of heaven and subjects of the eternal king. So uh, we would uh, pray together on this Sunday. O oh God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to that place where our Savior Christ has gone before, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. Uh, as soon as the disciples get back to Jerusalem after the ascension, they begin in, in I guess we might say, good sheepdog fashion uh, to worry about the order of church life, about how they are going to be organizing themselves uh, 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 while they await uh, Jesus' return. Um, they think about all of the things that have happened in the past couple of months from uh, Palm Sunday and Easter through the ascension. I just think what a jumble it must have been for them. And they were asking, well, what do we do now? How do we, how do we live through this time and figuring out how to deal with all of this change? Um, and one of the first things that comes to them is a question uh, that actually we live with in the church and continue to live with, to deal with in one way or another and in every generation, uh, which is as Christ builds his strong and beautiful church spiritually, uh, how do we reflect that? How do we participate with that in the practicalities of church life, and especially in terms of how we organize ourselves as a church? Uh, in those days after Easter, we had a, a church that was made up of those who had followed Jesus, his disciples, men and women, young and old, uh, some who have been apparently with Jesus for quite a while, all the way from the time of his baptism in the Jordan by John the Baptist. And, and maybe some who'd come much more recently, some who had just caught a glimpse of him, maybe even on Palm Sunday, just a few weeks ago, um, as they uh, were with the crowds of Jerusalem. But, but they have come and, and they've, they've joined the family. They've, they've become a part of the Jesus family. And, and uh, then in the midst of this assembly of those who had followed Jesus, his disciples, um, we had uh, a group of disciples that Jesus had particularly called. We know them as the Twelve, and they always seem to have a, a special role in the midst of this larger group of Jesus' followers. And, and uh, this group of the Twelve is really wounded right now, and they seem to be flying in what we would call the missing man formation. Uh, Judas Iscariot had abandoned them, abandoned the Twelve. He had betrayed Jesus. Uh, and then in a frenzy of despair, he had killed himself. And the, the horrible memory of all of that was still palpable, still hanging over them, a painful and ugly cloud. Uh, they knew that they needed to move forward. And to do that, they would need to, to fill the chair. They would need to move past Judas uh, so there wouldn't be that empty seat at the table staring at them whenever uh, they gathered. And, and uh, uh, of course, as we, we see this scene here in the very first part of Acts, uh, uh, we know that we actually uh, continue with that sort of task all the time ourselves, not always as dramatically, of course, as, as uh, the disciples were uh, dealing with that at the beginning of Acts. Uh, but I remember, you know, in, a, in the church that Susie and I attended in Northern California, right before I went to seminary, 
which is a St. Luke's Church in Auburn, California. There was a, a wonderful woman, a dear friend of ours, Beth Renning, uh, who back then in the early 1980s, very early 1980s, uh, was in her middle 80s. And she had been baptized there at St. Luke's and had lived much of her life as part of that church and community, although she had spent uh, some part of her time in some very adventurous ways as well and in, 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 all around the world. Uh, but we were at one point uh, in that little church uh, dealing with a very painful transition in clergy leadership. And um, there were a lot of people in that congregation who were worried, they were very anxious. But in the midst of that, Beth was, was an anchor. She always seemed very calm. And uh, she said one time in a, in a conversation, I just love this. She said, you know, priests come and priests go. And I, I think that was actually very helpful for us. Um, uh, it's kind of settled in as we uh, dealt with the turmoil of some difficult times in the church. Priests come and priests go. Uh, sometimes uh, priests arrive in a congregation and they make a big splash. They shake things up in really good ways. And sometimes priests arrive with a big splash and shake things up in bad ways. Sometimes, sometimes it takes a while uh, to clean up the mess they've made after they depart. Sometimes we love them, and sometimes not so much. Uh, sometimes they're here with us for decades, for good or for ill, and sometimes it seems like they're only here for 15 minutes. But, but in the end, as Beth reminded us, they come and they go. It's the way it is in the life of the church. Priests come and priests go. You know, we're going through a transition now in our Diocese of Pittsburgh. Um, Bishop McConnell retiring uh, later this fall, uh, an election coming up in just a few weeks, and uh, with a certain amount of understandable anxiety out there about what that's going to mean. I, I kind of need to hear Beth Renning in the background saying, bishops come and bishops go. Uh, so we're, we're hearing in, 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 in our first reading from Acts today about the calling of Matthias uh, to join the Twelve. And uh, it's really a good reading, perhaps, for our, our diocese in particular to be hearing in these weeks. Uh, um, not because we would be called uh, exactly to replicate the procedure the eleven disciples used to, to negotiate their transition, <clears throat> though I would, I would note that it would be a much simpler and much, much less expensive way to do things than the way we do things these days. Um, but <clears throat> because I think we can appreciate the deeper pattern of what's going on in that church of Jerusalem, we can appreciate their sense that God is in charge of their process, that they aren't in charge, but that God is in charge. Uh, they don't, uh, it's not that they don't work uh, in discernment, uh, they know that they must be sure that the person who will take up this new leadership role will be a true follower of Jesus. They'll have been tried and tested over time. They'll be mature in faith. <clears throat> they will be witnesses, true, a true witness of the risen Lord. Uh, so, so that discernment, that process, we might say, of nomination has a very important role to play. Uh, but then in the end, they, they roll the dice, they, they, they spin a bottle, they, they flip a coin. Uh, not because they think there's something magical going on, uh, but because they know, uh, having done that good work of discernment, uh, they know that Jesus is going to be with them, and that Jesus will be there, and that with Jesus there, things are going to be okay, even better than okay, uh, that, that things are going to be the way they are supposed to be. Uh, in the end, it's all about God. It's about how we are the sheep dogs and not the sheep herders, uh, the, the laborers, but not the contractors, not the engineers, not the architects. Uh, it isn't we who are gathering his flock. It isn't we who are building the church. It's Jesus. And so, so I guess uh, that is to say, that's the word, uh, a reflection. And what a long reflection today uh, for our first reading uh, from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verses 15 through 26. In those days, Peter stood up among the brethren. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brethren, 
the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who was guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their language, Akeldama, that is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of the Psalms, let his habitation become desolate and let there be no one to live in it and his office let another take. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all of the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness of, to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Lord, who knowest the hearts of all men, show which one of these two thou hast chosen to take place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go his, to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was enrolled with the eleven apostles. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So after we hear this first reading, the, the election of, of a, a new overseer, a new apostle, a new witness, after we hear this, uh, we continue on Sunday morning and respond to that by reading together Psalm 1, which has the title, the Latin title, Beatus Vir, uh, the first two words in the Latin translation of the psalm that mean, blessed is the man. Actually, I'm going to say that I don't really love our 1979 prayer book translation, especially at this point, but, but, but that's where we are. In any case, Psalm 1, anyway, is a psalm about where true godly wisdom comes from. Uh, the 11 uh, are looking for a new apostle who will come alongside them and be an effective witness. And uh, so they know that he must be someone who has been rooted and growing in the same soil that they have been growing in all these years. Someone who's been walking with Jesus and listening to him. Somebody who's been spiritually percolating in Jesus' presence. Somebody who has already seen and known the risen Lord and already put his trust in him. Uh, that would be be helpful as we think about that process of the disciples' discernment, to think about the soil that we plant ourselves in or that we are planted in. Uh, uh, information technology people uh, talk about computer programs and they have a saying, garbage in, garbage out, uh, which means that the computer is only as good as the software that it runs on. If you put bad software in, then there's nothing the hardware can do to make the computer work right. And, and so that's the contrast for Psalm 1, all about getting the right software in us, get good software in us. And hovering in the background of the Psalm, Beatus Vir, blessed is the man, is our memory of the one true man of blessing. Jesus himself, uh, who was not simply planted in the soil of the word, but was himself, is himself the word made flesh and his presence revealing to us the fullness of God, the fullness of God's blessing. So we'll read together Psalm 1. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord. They meditate on his law day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked shall not stand upright when justice ju judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 
After the psalm on Sunday, we'll, we'll hear our second reading, uh, continuing our Easter season series of readings from the first letter of John, this week, chapter 5, verses 9 to 13. Uh, John here is talking about our witness and our leadership, actually, in the church, about the, the character and role of leadership that every Chris, Christian has to play, and, and in a way I think is, is helpful in the context of our reading from Acts, as the, the disciples were praying over their call to apostolic witness. Um, thinking uh, first of all about what they were talking about as the qualifications that led them to call Justice and Matthias forward at that time, uh, and, and thinking if I can use that same word about our qualifications, about what it is in us that qualifies us for life in the church, for uh, being a part of the body of Christ. I mean, it's not as though these qualifications are something that we can uh, achieve through our own effort, efforts. Uh, we can take a, a class or earn a diploma to become qualified as Christians, uh, but it is about describing who we are and what we become as we are in Christ. So we, we hear this reading uh, from 1 John. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, that he has borne witness to his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne to his Son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son has not life. I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so then on to our gospel reading this Sunday from the 17th chapter of John this week, uh, verses 6 through 19. Uh, in our gospel, uh, we're back once again on this Sunday. We're back in the upper room with Jesus and his disciples on the night of Maundy Thursday, Holy Thursday, the night uh, before he went out into the garden, before he was betrayed and arrested, uh, his last night, his last supper uh, with his disciples. And uh, in the midst of this last supper uh, uh, from a section in John's gospel, which is sometimes called Jesus' great high priestly prayer, it's his prayer prayer for his church, for, for his disciples, for the twelve, uh, for the disciples that would follow like Justice and Matthias as uh, they would follow along, and, and for you and for me, for, for all of us in the life of the church. Jesus praying for, uh, for those who are now and those who will be the nominees to be the next bishop of Pittsburgh for sure, and, and, and all of us together uh, uh, as we come and we go. Uh, that we would be ourselves, that all of us would be like trees planted in that good soil, that our roots would be deep down and fed with the living water of God's holy word, nourished by that word, and bring forth in our lives the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, so we hear today the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory be to thee, O Lord. I have manifested thy name, to the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept my word. Now they know that everything that thou hast given me is from thee. For I have given them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I am praying for them, I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom thou hast given me, for they are thine. All mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to thee. Holy Father, keep them in thy name, which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in thy name, which thou hast given me. I have guarded them, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. 
But now I am coming to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not pray that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou didst send me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be consecrated in truth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. So in the midst of this season of the Ascension, uh, in uh, an important time in our community as we emerge from the, the long uh, uh, process of dealing with this pandemic, uh, an important time for our diocese as we uh, bid farewell to Bishop Dorsey and as we uh, see what God has in mind for us next in terms of our, our bishop and our leadership, uh, important for us and for all of us, uh, we, we pray that we will uh, be inspired to roll up our sleeves and do the good work that we're called to do of discernment and, and care for, for the life of the church. And, and then we pray some more. And most of all, we give thanks for the one who is in charge, uh, the one who holds us and who holds the whole world in his hands. So blessings to you in this season. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be amongst you and remain with you this day, this ascension season, and always. Amen.